Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mark. Merry Christmas. And as someone yelled out, was that, was that Doug's voice I recognized? We're not just celebrating Jesus' birth, we're celebrating Pastor Derek's birth, which today is his literal birthday. And I have not gotten you a gift yet, but you preached on waiting last week. So just going to have to practice what you preach and wait. It'll be epic. Just have to think of it. It's been a busy season. Your birthday snuck up on me. But welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. It's the second to last day of Hanukkah. It's Christmas. It's Derek's birthday. There's a lot going on. We are in week two of our Honest Advent series, which, as Derek already set up, is inspired by a work of art by a good friend of mine and my wife, Lauren. Where is she? Hi, baby. Uh, Scott. So Scott will be in town next week preaching, and he's going to walk us through. You can see some of his art throughout the space, which is really, really cool. It's what inspired this series. So let me give you an overview of what this honest advent is all about. This is from Scott. He says, for too many of us, the celebration of Christmas has lost its wonder. Maybe for you, it has become a bittersweet season of complicated family dynamics. Should be some amens in the room for that. A predictable brand masking insatiable consumerism. Mm. Or simply a sacred story that feels too far removed from our current chaotic world. Honest Advent seeks to illuminate the astonishing, hope-filled truth that the God who showed up in the hardest parts of our humanity is still showing up today in those same places. So what Scott is really trying to invite us into is an experience where Advent becomes real and relevant again. Where it's not just a story we've heard as children or that we go through the motions every December. That is not just focused on this consumeristic model that the world offers to us. That's really trying to get us to buy and sell and do things. He's saying Christmas not only was relevant 2,000 years ago, but it is relevant today because the God who is with us, Emmanuel, it's still with us now. You can even throw up, actually, uh, if you guys have the, the Alpha and Omega images that Scott has, they're on this side of the wall. I think it's fascinating. Scott painted these three vignettes of the Lamb of God with different symbolism attached to it. And it's from one of those scriptures that we just heard from Chris and Michelle in Revelation, where the Lamb of God declares, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, the one who was, and the one who always will be and is still to come, the Almighty One. You see, God isn't just the God of Christmas past or even Christmas is to come. He's the God present with us. Emmanuel transcends time and space. The almighty, infinite being, God, who breathes everything into existence. At Christmas, we celebrate him stepping into human history, becoming the God incarnate. And I believe that moment is what the entire universe orbits and revolves around. When Jesus enters time and space, comes as a baby being knit in the womb of Mary through the scary, risky process of childbirth. 2,000 years ago when medical science was not as good as it was today and health was low and, and having a child was very risky for the mother and the baby, the God Almighty chose to become one of us. And we're going to talk about this, that this morning and how that affects us and how that is still so pertinent to our lives today. And we we can go through if you show, oh, there you go. You already showed the other images. That's perfect. Thanks for doing that. And as Derek mentioned last week, Advent, this word Advent, it means coming or arrival. And it's a season where we prepare for and celebrate the coming and the arrival of Jesus Christ. And it is in this waiting, as Derek preached about, that God often does some of his greatest work, or he can. I love a quote from Rich Viotis who says this. He says, what God does in us while we wait is often more important than what we're waiting for. It's hard to see that, though. And I think if we're really willing to engage in Advent in fresh ways, we see that not only is God teaching us patience and how to wait for things, 
he's also teaching us what to wait for. He's reshaping our hopes and our longings and our expectations. Because that's the truth of the Christmas story as well, is, is that not only did people not necessarily see the coming Messiah, it just, maybe they saw him and it wasn't what they wanted. Or even now, we hear the story of Jesus and we're like, eh, someone who, who empties himself, who self-sacrifices so that others can be lifted up, someone who came poor into a poor family who didn't come with all the pop and circumstance, I don't know if I want that. I see the Messiah, but it doesn't match my expectation. And so what do we do with that? Well, we're going to talk about that this morning as well. But I love the concept of, of honest Advent. Is Scott is using a different medium beyond just a sermon or words to communicate deep truth. He's using visual art. Because while Scott is many things, a talented writer and speaker, first and foremost, he is a visual artist. And I love how art can convey meaning in ways that words never can. Are you for the, the saying, picture's worth a thousand words? Yeah. I think sometimes a picture is worth an infinite number of words. Sometimes no amount of language could communicate a truth that an image could, or a sound, or a song. I mean, I was thinking last night, there was this Christmas tune that I must have heard it when I was a little kid. Have you ever heard of the band For Him? Does anybody even know what that band is? Doug and Debbie know. <laughs> Apparently, they were like a wannabe boy band from like the 90s or something. I, I don't know. And, and this tune, it's called A Strange Way to Save the World. Debbie loves it. You want to come up and sing it? <laughs> I must have heard this at my grandma's house when I was a kid. But it popped into my brain last night. And I remembered like the entire chorus. It's Joseph singing as he's holding baby Jesus in his arms. And he's like, why me? I'm just a simple man of trade. Why here in this stable filled with hay? And he's like, why this baby with all the rulers in the world? And he's like, why her, an ordinary girl? Like I remember those lyrics. And he's like, I'm not one to second, I'm not going to sing the melody, but he's like, I'm not one to second guess what angels have to say, but this is such a strange way to save the world. Because it doesn't meet any of our expectations. It flies in the face of everything we would think that a powerful ruler would do. And that melody stuck in my brain. And my wife will know, I'm terrible at song lyrics. I'm always getting them wrong. Like in the car, I'm always belting out like the completely wrong words. I remember that one song where I thought they were singing about catching fish said, there's a song called Feels by Pharrell and Katy Perry. This is like three, four years ago. And the chorus is, I want to catch feels. Do you really want to catch feels? Eh. I thought it was singing about catching fish. <laughs> and she's like, you idiot. Why would they be singing about fish? That's one of a thousand examples of how I get lyrics wrong. But this for him tune, I know every word. And it's that art that was able to communicate and convey this emotion and this reality within my soul somewhere that just a mere text or a sermon could never do. And so in this way, these images can reveal to us deeper levels of truth. My wife and I just celebrated our ninth anniversary on Wednesday. Woo! Nine years, baby. Going strong. Past that seven-year itch, we're doing it. We're doing great. And it was a really, really fun day. It's been uh, I, you know, we hate using the word busy, we all do, but it, it's been a very busy season, if we're going to be honest, but it was such a refreshing, restorative little break. We took the, the day off, we're like, we don't have time to take work off, but we're doing it anyways. And we went to LA, we had some hikes, we went to uh, this Japanese place for dinner, it was called Sushi Miyagi, which I was all pumped about that name, I'm like, yeah, Karate Kid. Wax on, wax off. And Lauren's like, you can't say any of that stuff. This is a nice place. You will not embarrass me. And so we get there, and it's really just, it's, Michael, what, where's Michael? Cologne, what is it called again where you get, like, every meal is a single, omakase. So it's just, it's husband and wife, the chef and his wife, and she's serving us this incredible snow age sake, which apparently makes it better. I don't know. It was great. And then they're making this phenomenal meal that's like just course after course of like these crazy fish eggs that I'm proud of us for eating. They were delicious. And then uh, we were talking about where they're from, and he's like, oh, yeah, I'm actually from Miyagi. And I'm like doing everything I can, like don't say anything about Karate Kid. 
just keep your mouth shut. And then he says in his thick Japanese accent, which I will not attempt to do, he's like, you know, Miyagi, like Mr. Miyagi, Karate Kid. And like, see, babe, he loves it too. He's all wax on, wax off. I'm like, yes, thank you. Apparently he wanted to have a photo of Mr. Miyagi, but the, the family, the real family lives like a few blocks away. And they're like, please don't. <laughs> please don't put our photo on your restaurant wall. But it was an incredible meal, such a great time. And early in the day, we had gone to the Getty Museum. Has anybody been to the Getty in LA? I had never been. My well, sort a bunch, bucket list for me to go. Free museum. I mean, parking costs you a ton of money. That's how they get you. But it's a free museum. And it was so fun for us to go through and see these different stages of human creativity and art. And much of the art had spiritual religious overtones. Because a lot of the art came from the Renaissance period where the stories of scripture highly influenced these creatives and these painters and these sculptors and these artists. And I loved how each of these images communicated truth to me in ways, once again, that words alone couldn't do. Here's, I won't show you a ton of examples. Could we show one of them? Uh, how about the first, this one? One of, one of millions. This is actually Jesus. I don't know if you have a story. There was a woman who was accused of adultery brought to Jesus. And the powers that be wanted to test him. And they're like, hey, she committed adultery. According to the law, we should kill her. We should stone her. What do you think we should do? And Jesus famously writes down in the sand and then says, whoever has no sin, throw the first stone. And they all drop the stones and leave. But I love this. This painting is like 20 feet wide, painted in the 1500s. And at first you're like, white Jesus, problematic, 100%. But at the same time, it was painted by these white artists. And I noticed how Jesus is in these kind of old Middle Eastern clothes, yet the soldiers were in contemporary garb of the day. That's what the soldiers would have worn in the 1500s when the painter painted this. And like, to us, it all feels old-timey. But to the viewer back then, it would have communicated this relevance and this immediacy. It'd be as if we painted something now where people are in, you know, cop uniform. And, and everyone else is wearing suit and tie. Stuff that we would see, skinny jeans, flannel. And what it did is the artist drew you into the moment and saying, no, that's us saying, stone her, stone her, stone her. And Jesus is saying, you who have no sin, throw the first stone. This is one of these thousands of examples of that, what Scott's art can do, and what art in general can do for us. Pull us deeper and deeper into these truths of Advent to reveal to us what Jesus is trying to teach us, what he is trying to communicate to us. And so I think it's just, I love what art can do. So we're going to talk about a few concepts, a few themes from Scott's work. So I got a new iPad that's uh, it's not being nice to me today. We talked a little bit about expectations and how that song reveals to me how Joseph was like, what's happening? This is not a, how you would expect to save the world. And it ties into this idea of attention that Scott calls out. How sometimes it's easy for us to not notice what's happening around us. We stay stuck in the dark. And it's the Magi, for example. If you recall these folks, the three wise men, as sometimes they've been called. We know there's more than three. We don't know if there are men. It could have been women as well. From the east, they see this star. And these foreigners are the ones who come. And they're the ones who notice that something's happening. And they respond to what Jesus is doing. And I love in Matthew, where they come and they say, Where is this newborn king of the Jews? We saw his stars that rose, and we have come to worship him. Once again, it's upending how you would expect the Savior of the Jewish people to arrive. That foreigners would come and see this. Moving on to Isaiah 9, it says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. These lights are dawning, these stars are shining, but sometimes it's hard for us to see because we miss what God is doing. So I don't usually use notes, and now my notes are all messed up here. You guys are so nice for bearing with me. 
This is why I don't use notes. Because then when you need to use notes and they don't work, you're like, why is this page not turning? I don't want to use notes. Don't worry. I had a thought. Uh, I saw this quote from Shane Claiborne, who's a theologian, and someone had asked him recently, are you a Christian? If you know Shane, he's someone who kind of uh, has lived sort of on the fringes of the Christian world, and he's someone who's very dedicated to serving the poor, serving the oppressed, working for justice. We just did a justice series. He's been on the front lines of that for a long time, and that can be controversial in a lot of ways. And someone asked him, are you a Christian? And I loved his response because he said, rather than listing off a litany of beliefs, he's like, why don't you ask the poor and the oppressed around me and see what they say? He's like, if you want to know if I'm a Christian, I'm not going to dictate to you some verse or some creed. I'm going to ask you to ask my neighbors. And they will tell you. And I thought about this. You know, at Christmas time, we always have the different bumper stickers, right? Keep Christ in Christmas and whatnot. And, and, and of course, Jesus is the reason for the season. And because Jesus is the reason for the season, I think about how Christ is wanting to get himself into us so that we can do what Shane just did. We can love the poor and the marginalized because that's who Jesus was. That's who his family was. You can see Jesus was in a manger, in a stable, because there was no room for them in the inn. And I wonder if there wasn't, there might have been room in the inn, but maybe they couldn't afford it. Or maybe there was no room in the inn for people who were from Galilee, a no-name town. Maybe there was no room in the inn for people who was a teenage mother having a child would appear to be out of wedlock. There could have been a million reasons why there was no room for them at the inn. And we see, once again, a strange way for Jesus to enter into the world. And I wonder if those, there's a reason that Jesus has such a soft spot for those who have been marginalized, who have been oppressed, who are on the fringes, because Jesus was that himself. You know, I think about Matthew 23 when Jesus says, Blessed are you who gave me a drink, who visited me in prison, who gave me food to eat when I was hungry. And they're like, when do we ever do this? And Jesus is like, well, you did it for the least of these, you did it unto me. Because Jesus was the least of these when he entered into this world. Born in this manger, in this stable. And we don't even see all the, I could spend all morning talking about the different examples of this. We forget sometimes that after Jesus was born in the manger, in the stable, that Herod, the power to be when the Magi came and said, where is the king of the Jews who want to worship him? The person who was in power didn't see Messiah's coming as something to be celebrated, but something that would threaten his own power and his own might. And so what did Herod do? He tries to kill all the children. And so Joseph, being warned in a dream, flees to Egypt. And we see in this scenario that Jesus and Mary and Joseph, the Holy Family, were refugees fleeing political violence. They entered into Egypt as aliens, as foreigners, as undocumented people. We don't always see that part of the Christmas story. It was only several years later that they had to return to their homeland. But I just had this thought, and I know I'm all over the place because my notes aren't working, but once again, Jesus was the person at the border. This was the Holy Family. So when we're talking about Christmas and Advent and might and power and noticing and attention, how often do we not see the people that are the most closely connected to who Jesus was at the Christmas time story? We look up here, we look up at the lights and the stage and the sound, and we don't notice the young couple in the back. And so I think part of this honest Advent is is trying to get us to relearn, to re-see, to re-notice, not just the stars in the sky, 
but the couples at the border, the couples at the fringes, the couples in the stable because there was no room for them at the inn. I think this is the honest advent that Jesus is calling us to remember. Let's see if I can get this page to come up here. All right, some more scriptures popped up. That's great. I'm going to begin to wrap up with this final theme, because it's the only one showing here, about mightiness. That's another chapter in Scott's book, which you should pick up and read. I got a few copies if you want one, or you can buy them online. Might, power. What does the power of God look like compared to the power of the world? And how is Christmas revealing that truth to us? And so I'm going to walk us through a portion of the Christmas story that we might not always see. And hopefully mine and harvest some, some truth from it. You see, there's four Gospels, and the Gospel of, of, of Mark doesn't even address the Christmas story. He just jumps right into the action. It's the shortest of the books. I forget the Latin term for it, but it means moving right into the action. It's like, move them us, action us, like, <laughs> like something like that. He goes right into it. And then you've got John, who's poetic and universal and uses this cosmic language to say the word, the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh, became incarnate, and dwelt among us. The light dwelt among us, and the darkness cannot overcome it. And then there's Matthew, who's writing primarily to a Jewish audience, and he unpacks a lot of the deep humanity of Jesus and the lineage connecting him to King David. And, and Matthew is where we see the Magi from the East. And we see Joseph, this humble man of trade. This man who probably died when Jesus was young, because we don't see him in later stories. Who was humble and noble and could have made a scene, but decided to take care of Mary and adopt Jesus as his own and raise him in the ways of righteousness. But in the Gospel of Luke, I want to sit in that for a moment. Luke was the only Gentile writer of scriptures. He wrote in elegant Greek because he was Greek. And he reveals a lot of nuances and details that we don't see in the other Gospels. He highlights a lot of the women's stories. We see Elizabeth. She's made a main character. We see Mary as a main character. We don't always look at when, after the angel Gabriel, right, and, and, and the story leaves telling Mary that she's going to carry the Messiah what is Mary's response? She, she writes a song. There's like a whole half-page poem that Mary declares. And I love we have this old quote from Erwin McManus that, that creativity is a natural result of spirituality. Like God moved in her life, and once again, she produces art. She produces song. She produces his painting. She has to declare God's goodness in some way. It's in Luke that we see the lineage of Jesus, and he inserts people like Rahab, and Bathsheba, and Tamar, and all these women who you wouldn't necessarily want in your family tree. And Luke calls them out by name. And so I'm going to pick up here in Luke 2. It's after Jesus has already been born. On the eighth day, per the Jewish law, Mary and Joseph take Jesus to be circumcised and consecrated. And there's a detail in there that they don't expound upon, but you see that they offer two pigeons as an offering. And if you know the history, the Levitical thing, you're supposed to offer a lamb. And if you can't afford a lamb, well, then you can do this. And if you can't afford that, you can do this. And it goes down this list to the very, very, very bottom. It's like, if you can't afford any of that, you can just give two pigeons. That's, that'll suffice. And so we see not so much being told, but being shown right there that Jesus' family was poor. They didn't have material wealth. Once again, the Savior of the universe chose to enter into history this way. And so it's at this moment that Mary and Joseph take Jesus to be consecrated, to be dedicated. And it says this, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus 
to do for him what the custom law required, a.k.a. get circumcised. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may not all dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and a glory of your people Israel. Simeon, this guy's been waiting for a long time for the Messiah to come. No one else notices, but he does. He's like, ah, this humble family is it. He praises God. And it says this, the child's father and mother, Mary and Joseph, marveled at what was said about Jesus. And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your soul too. Dang. So they take Jesus to get consecrated to have this beautiful little ceremony that we do here often. And this old guy, Simeon, shows up and he sings this beautiful hymn over Jesus. And then he turns to Mary and he's like, your baby's going to cause the rising and falling of many. And they're like, uh, all right, bro. <laughs> like, thanks for the kind words, uh, stranger. It's kind of a, kind of a harsh greeting for us. And he's like, and, and a sword's going to pierce your heart too. Because once again, Jesus, it's not just a sanitized, safe story of this little gentle baby showing up in a manger, making us all feel warm and fuzzy. Yes, Jesus is the hope of the world. Yes, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. The mighty God, as it said in Isaiah, wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. But he's also going to shake up our values and our expectations. He's going to open our eyes if we'll allow him to see those on the fringes around us. He's going to open our eyes to the things within our life that need to be let go of, that need to be let to die so that new life can spring forth. He's calling out a new form of might and power that this baby is going to exhibit. And then the very next verse says, there also was a prophet, Anna. Luke keeps calling out these powerful women. The daughter of Puniel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old, and she had lived with her husband seven years after marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped day and night, fasting and praying. And coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. And when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law, they returned to Galilee. And the child grew and became strong, was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was with them. I love this woman, Anna. When I was thinking about her last night, I was reminded so before this beautiful merger of North Park Baptist and Maker's Church that happened a couple of years ago, Maker's Church, we used to be downtown for a season. This was a while back for about three, four years. And we were meeting in two different locations, both in East Village. Our second spot was on 16th Street. So we were right in the thick of it, right in the heart of a lot of just kind of poverty and chaos. And it was actually a really beautiful, fruitful season of life. I loved doing church down there. And I helped start a ministry uh, called Love Your Block. And I passed it on to some incredible people, Michelle and Neil and Randall, who took it on after that. But really, we were just trying to meet our neighbors, specifically the people living on the street, just to see them as peers, to love them, to encourage them, to invite them to be a part of us at church. And there was this woman, Juanita, who was an older woman, been living on the street for many years in a wheelchair, and if you saw her, she was someone that you might overlook. At least maybe I would. I don't want to judge what you would do. On the surface, you might pity her. Uh, not think she had anything to offer, perhaps. And Juanita, Juanita was a prophet. Because she would come up to me. She would wheel up to me after almost every Sunday. And she would either pray over me. Or speak truth to me. And besides perhaps Raheem or, or Pastor Glenn or Pastor Rob, I've never had someone pray more powerfully for me. Every single word out of her mouth was unexpected and piercing. And it felt like vocalizations directly from the mouth of God. 
She was so full of love and grace and encouragement and power. And she would just cut to the heart of things. And I know it's not necessarily something we talk about a lot at Christmas time, Simeon and Anna, but I'm just reminded of the power of Juanita in my life. And I thank God that I had at least some eyes to see and not to overlook what was happening, to not miss the star, not miss the breadcrumbs, not miss the young couple in the stable, to not expect that God can only operate out of those people and in those ways in this format, but to be sensitive to God's spirit moving in all these different contexts. Knowing that the story of Christmas, the Advent story, is Christ arriving in a lowly way so that he can raise us up. As it says this in Philippians 2, Paul encourages us here. He says, in your relationships with one another, so you all, me, us, in our relationships with each other, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. This power, this might, this equality with God was not something to be used for his own sake. Rather, he emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God lifted him up and exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. He emptied himself. He gave his power away so that we could be lifted up. We don't talk about might or power very often, I think, at church. But one of my favorite verses is 2 Timothy 1.7 where he says, The Spirit of the Lord does not bring about timidity, but love, power, and self-control. You see, I was often raised being told to slow down to calm down, to quiet down, to simmer down, to get down, stay down. <laughs> a lot of down things. I was very, you know, active. But then Jesus, because he emptied himself and came down and he was raised up, he is always telling us to stand up, to get up, to rise up and walk, to look up, to pray up to have hope because of his way down and then up. He allows us to be lifted up along with him. And there's a, I want to show an image from Scott around this mighty concept. Might, might jar you at first if we can pull it up here. We can listen to Dan's beautiful piano. It's the one with the baby. Oh, no worries. I can always describe it. Like I said earlier, it's not going to do it. But uh, we'll give it just a few more seconds here. Sorry for failures with iPads and images. Oh, there it is. Here's an image that some of you may not be thrilled to see at first, and some may love it. It says, Mighty God. It's a little baby getting his butt wiped. But Philippians 2, we have no problem showing Jesus on a cross, which is even more lowly than this. But it says Jesus emptied himself, became human, became vulnerable. Jesus needed Mary and Joseph to care for him. He would not have survived without their love and provision. You parents know this. I, am, I don't have the kids yet, but I'm baffled when I'm wearing friends who do around my nieces and nephews just how helpless babies are. Like they would not last a day. 
Like, I, you're like, duh, obviously. But Jesus chose to be that kind of vulnerable, to place his life in the hands of us flawed humans. He chose that. He subjected himself to needing to get his butt wiped by Mary and Joseph and who other aunties and uncles and neighbors helped. Isn't that a strange thought? Once again, the For Him song, what a strange way to save the world. But those details matter. Every single detail in this Christmas story, and I touched 5% of them, not even, they matter. We can pray, why, so what? Jesus, why did you come this way? And how does that challenge and inspire and affect me now? What does that mean for my life? What does it mean for your life? Jesus emptied himself. The mighty God, the almighty Father, became nothing. In Greek, it says he became nothing for our sake so that he could raise us up. And this is the Christmas story and we are called to follow. You see, because Jesus needed to know, he needed, he needed to understand what it was like to be us, to save us. Even God himself, you can know what pain feels like conceptually, but until you feel it, you don't really know. There's a scene from Good Will Hunting, it's one of my favorites, where Robin Williams' character tells the young Goodwill, he's like, yeah, you've read a lot of books. You know a lot of facts. But do you know what the Sistine Chapel smells like? You could recite to me Shakespeare's sonnets on love, but do you know what it's like to hold your wife's hand as she dies from cancer? You've seen films about parents and fathers, but do you know what it's like to care for a being more than your life itself? So even God said, I need to become one of my creations, my children's, so that I can truly understand, so that I can truly become their Savior. And that is the story of Christmas. So us, as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus, we cannot just live out life at observation distance. The invitation is to move past observation into participation. To move past past just this being a story of someone else to being a story of our lives. Beyond just being these tales of what could be to what's real for us. I want that. I don't want to just talk about these characters. I want my own experiences with the Holy Spirit. I want my own moments of self-sacrifice of lifting up, of being loved, seeing God move, seeing God's spirit move. I want to see my own stars and follow where the spirit leads. And we're all called to that. And that is Advent. That's the honest Advent. It will cost us much. The way up is down. And I'll close with this verse here. Well, one last thought and then this verse. I love that we see the way that Jesus loves and uses his power and might. He never uses power to control us or over us, but he calls power out of us. He doesn't wield us over us, but he calls it out of us, and we're called to do the same. Because it says this in Ephesians 3, it says, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ever ask or think. God who is able through his mighty power at work where? Within us. The story of Christmas is not a story where we wait for God to come fix everything. It is a story where God's mighty power is offered to be within us so that he can accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. We think this verse is let's pray and then God will do all these things. No, we pray and then God empowers us, his people, his body, his bride, to do more than we ever think we could. That is the story of Christmas, the beginning of this journey that we're invited into. Let me pray as we, as we close and we worship. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit uh, moves in spite of 
uh, scattered thoughts and, and, and notes, but, oh. Holy Spirit, I just pray that even as we wrap up this gathering, that it is just a beginning as we move into this Christmas season. God, may your spirit do more this morning than I could ever hope or imagine. May you teach us that we are mighty and powerful in your name. And may you teach us how to use might and power to love others, to lift others up, to not miss your activity in unexpected places. May we learn to expect the unexpected place. May those places no longer feel strange because we anticipate you to be in the fringes, to be in the center, to be in all these places, to be everywhere. You're not just in the fringes either. You're, you're in all these places and spaces. You are moving in the great and the powerful and the mighty just like you are moving in the poor shepherds. God, this Christmas season, may we learn that your goal is to get Christ into us, to get yourself into us so that we can live out what it means to celebrate this season. God, you once asked, do we love you? And the response was, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, tend my sheep. If you love me, care for my people. Thank you for doing that for us, and may we be encouraged to do the same for others. It's in the name that is above every name, the name that every knee and every tongue will confess and every knee will bow to eventually. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.